folk. Uh, welcome to 2024, my first uh, upload of a dialogue with friends, which has come out somewhat spontaneously, fittingly, over the Christmas season for reasons that will become clear. I have with me two friends, Michael Cossa and Rebecca Burnt, whose faith journey has been very much influenced, as is mine, by the writing and the poetry of T.S. Eliot. And I discovered this and I thought to myself, well, why don't I just put the two of them together and make a connection? And let's have a dialogue and conversation on how has T.S. Eliot's poetry helped them in their faith journey, respectively. I've also got a bit of a story to tell about that, but um, so I wanted to maybe just ask Rebecca, do you want to kick off and just introduce yourself a bit and uh, give us a an outline of what your interest is for maybe just a minute or so and then I'll ask Mark to do the same. Sure um so I'm Rebecca my name is Rebecca Burnt I'm a spiritual director former critical care nurse and I write um and I think that's how John and I kind of met is through my writing and um through our conversations and I'll just say my love of T.S. Eliot really well you know when so when I was very young uh my dad used to say, sometimes if we were going to go somewhere, he would say, let us go then you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky. And then I would say, oh, like a patient authorized upon a table. I don't know why we said that. To, and it, it doesn't have any real meaning other than it was, it was like almost, of course, those are the, the, the lines of, from Proof Rock. It was just something we would, we would say to one another. Now, sometimes that he's old, I ask him if he dares to eat a peach. Um, but <laughs> we um <laughs> that was probably my first encounter with T.S. Eliot but it was really um probably I think some of the most quoted and most famous lines from Four Quartets which come at the end very end of the poem uh we shall not cease from exploration and the end of all of our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time and I encountered that when I was still quite young in my early 20s maybe um or even late teens I can't remember and it was in the the early earlier days of the internet and I read it on someone's blog and I, it just it just spoke to me and then of course I went and I you know researched it and said oh this is this is from T.S. Eliot but those lines I think spoke to me because at the time I was really struggling with this sense of being very frustrated with Christianity, particularly the the faith that I had been raised in, a, a, a fairly fundamentalist and evangelical expression of it, and um, feeling the need to like get away from it, to explore, to discover. Uh, yeah, I mean, just trusting uh, something about those lines. I think spoke to me, spoke this idea to me that I could I could trust that impulse to leave and to explore and to discover. And over the years, it's come back to me again and again. And and what I've found is that my exploration, my um, needing to get some distance from G Jesus and from Christianity has always allowed me to come back to it with a renewed understanding and a renewed appreciation. And so it feels like a, a, a very cyclical sort of pattern in my life that is it's not just a, a static um, kind of cycle of leaving and returning, but it's one that always ha has a increasing depth and richness and sort of unfoldment <laughs> and that's the name of my sub stack is the unfolding and I think that that concept of like going in these circular patterns and, and allowing things to unfold as that happens has been something that's very meaningful to me that is why I ultimately ended up getting that tattooed on my back along with the interestingly the last line of the previous stanza is um you know, he says, history is now in an England with the drawing of this love and the voice of this calling. And then the next stanza is, we shall not cease from exploration. But it always felt to me like that line with the drawing of this love and the voice of this calling could almost be the first line <laughs> of uh, that's right before we shall not cease from exploration. Because it feels to me like that's always been the motivating force. That's that's the driving force. And so it's it's that line along with the next four that I have tattooed on my back. But it's on your back, so you don't see it, but only mm -hmm. people behind you see it, which of course... Yeah, is... they only see it in the summer, really. <laughs> <laughs> That's lovely. Thank you, Rebecca. Michael, do you want to just tell us a bit about your journey with T.S. Eliot? Well, uh, it was interesting hearing uh, Rebecca talk about what her father used to say, let us go, then you and I. <laughs> because I say that often uh, in our household, 
uh, I, I don't have um, my wife or, or children sort of completing the, the phrase, uh, but it's, it's very much part of our consciousness and my children in particular, I think, have inherited my love of T.S. Eliot. Of, of course, what's interesting is that Eliot was an American mm. who became a Brit. Mm. You know, if he'd been a Brit from the beginning, he wouldn't have said, let us go then, you and I. He <laughs> would have said, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> I taught English literature uh, at Wits University for five years. And in that time, I didn't teach T.S. Eliot, unfortunately. So my love of T.S. Eliot has come, you know, over, over many years. And it's, it's more a kind of consciousness uh, than a, an intense engagement with uh, the text. And, you know, so in that sense, I, again, uh, sympathize with Rebecca, what you were saying uh, in the beginning. It's just such a pleasure and joy for me to be able to actually reflect a little bit about my own narrative in terms of T.S. Eliot. It started obviously at school. I was, we did have T.S. Eliot's uh, Murder in the Cathedral as one of the uh, textbooks for our, what we call in South Africa, matric. Uh, it's grade 12, so it's half, last year of high school. And when I, my first year in university, the, there was a production of it at the open air theater of the University of KwaZulu Natal, where I was at. And I just became so absorbed as somebody just emerging in out of this sort of basic ignorance about what was happening in this country in South Africa, um, being in something of a cocoon. But it was 1976, it was the year of the Soweto riots. It was the, the year which all sorts of things started coming apart in this country. And um, that particular line, the last temptation is the greatest treason to do the right thing for the wrong reason, which for those who don't know, it's Thomas Beckett, the Archbishop, struggling with his own pride and his particular desire for the spiritual power of martyrdom. And ultimately the confrontation with that temptation is allows him to give up the ambition to try and be in control of his spiritual fate and to surrender to God's will. Now, that might be a very nice pietistic thought. Oh, we just go into a monastery and all the rest. But it was, I discovered, a very line which Martin Luther King Jr. used in his letters from a Birmingham jail where to underscore the principal criticism of the authorities who were perpetuating an unjust system under the guise of maintaining law and order. So T.S. Eliot hasn't been about my retreat into kind of contemplative pietism. It's actually been a spur to say, okay, John, what the hell are you going to do in this country in all this injustice and what have you? Well, if Martin Luther King found inspiration in poetry, well, so would, so would you. And, and so that's like the beginning. But the big milestone was when in 2001 or so, I was working for the World Health Organization. So this is now some 20 years on to, into my career. And a, a close friend of mine from my university days, uh, Len Abrams, was uh, working for the UN system before I did. He was working for the World Bank, traveling around Africa into various humanitarian situations as a hydrologist, looking at the desperate situation facing communities. And we were chatting at our group one day, and he just told me, he said, well, John, this is my, my, my development manifesto. And he quoted those lines from the, the Rock, where T.S. Eliot writes, I have trodden the wine press alone, and I know that it is hard to be really useful, resigning the things that men count for happiness, seeking the good deeds that lead to obscurity, accepting with equal face those that bring ignominy, the applause of all or the love of none. All men are ready to invest their money, but most expect dividends. I say to you, make perfect your will. I say, take no thought of the harvest, but only of proper sowing. So 
I then adopted that as a kind of a manifesto for myself or as a development philosophy for myself in my work uh, I, and found myself, you know, just working in the UN system as just seeing how so much interest was, what about the harvest? What about the un the outcome? And to have to have to come to that radical surrender, man, it's actually not up to you, John. Just make sure you plow, you do what you are most need to do and leave the rest up to something which is far greater than you. Um, otherwise, you're going to get yourself burnt out. And the interesting thing is that Len and I stay in touch. I was in conversation with him just recently, and I, he was thrilled to hear that we were now having this conversation about his inspiration because he's now left the World Bank. He works as, a, as an Anglican priest in, in, in the UK. That gives you a little bit of the texture for what i am been interested in. And, and the question I'm eager to know from both of you is, whether you've shared that struggle and whether in fact, maybe Mike, you can help me understand that T.S. Eliot himself in his own life clearly seems to have shown great evidence of somebody who really suffered. Well, I'm not, uh, I'm not an expert on, on uh, the life of, of T.S. Eliot, but I, I do know that he became an Anglican in early-ish in the, the 20th century. And it was at that point that he wrote uh, The Journey of the Magi. But before that, he had written the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. And then he wrote uh, The Wasteland and then Four Quartets. And he lived in, in the heart of the, the birth of modernism in the world, which, you know, which was displacing um, the Victorian era, and of course, it came with the uh, you know the rise of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, Eliot um, didn't have a very happy marriage. I think his love life generally was not was not happy. I think one sees some of this in the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Um, there are lots of images of despair, of ambivalence, ambiguity. Clearly, the poem is, is quite autobiographical, as is the, the journey of the Magi. You know, what, what's interesting for me is just to see the, the trajectory from uh, his, you know, writing of the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock to the journey of the Magi, the Wasteland, four quartets. Uh, and the transition point for him in, in joining the Anglican Church, but still feeling very um, unsure about it. It, it. It's captured in the journey of the matter because, you know, there's a lot of ambivalence uh, mm. in, in that poem. Mm. Now, I understand that his, his wife was eventually committed to a psychiatric hospital and died there. So, and then he remarried. And um, in that wonderful series, which Rebecca alerted us to, which I'll give a, people a link to, reflecting on the four quartets, uh, Professor Wilson helped me understand this extraordinary sense of how that first uh, quartet was actually a love story to somebody who was quite deeply romantically in love with. But I just found myself wondering, well, was that co ever consummated? And in the sense, it humanized T.S. Eliot for me because, you know, we live in a world now where those issues of need and the deep desire for intimacy, for affection, is, is like you can't escape it. And we see the consequence of what happens when institutions try and put a lid on it and try and suppress it. It comes up in all sorts of very distorted ways. Rebecca, do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I think this is so interesting because um, something I wanted to talk about, if we're going to talk about his biography, is is this kind of piece of his life that we've only begun to understand recently and that's only been shed light on recently because this woman, Emily Hale, who he was had quite a close, it seems, emotional and sort of um, intellectual relationship with where they wrote all these 
letters to one another and seems to have been very in love with her in his his love letters and to, to see her as something of a muse and who as um, James Matthew Wilson points out it, that Burnt Norton especially is uh, directly inspired by a holiday that he took with her. My understanding, and I, I, I haven't read, I, I read about this when it first came out a couple of years ago, um, and so I may remember this incorrectly, but was that there was maybe kind of a sense between them that they were they were kind of waiting for things to, I think he refused to divorce his wife, Vivian, who, who was mentally ill and committed to an institution. And there was kind of a sense between them. And, and I think what he communicated to Emily was like, I, you know, I'm just not willing to divorce her, but like if she wasn't in the way that the two of them would be together. Um, well, when she finally did pass away, uh, within a year or two, I believe, Elliot married someone else completely. Someone else, like, I think she was a secretary or somebody like that, right? And what's interesting is that Emily Hale uh, gave her her letters and her papers with T.S. Eliot, but like with the instructions that they be released after a certain period of time. Well, Eliot prepared a statement that was to be released when her papers were released. So a couple of years ago, it was time for her papers to be released and all of these letters. And his statement was also re released. And this is what he says. I was not in love with Emily Hale. I had already observed that she was not a lover of poetry. Certainly that she was not much interested in my poetry. I have I had already been worried by what seemed to me evidence of insensitiveness and bad taste. So... <laughs> <laughs> Goodness, I didn't know that. <laughs> I mean, that's just I and I I love I love Elliot. I think his poet is so poetry is so deeply insightful. But I think it's just you read that and you think, okay, there's some there's some deep stuff going on that he probably needed to work out with a therapist or somebody that never <laughs> did. Because <laughs> um, that is a that's a pretty cold statement to make about somebody who you've had so sort of a passionate emotional affair with for over twenty five years. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, that is interesting. Mark, did you know that? No, no, I, I, I didn't. Mm. Um, but you know, I'm thinking as you're talking, Rebecca. Uh, I don't know if you've heard uh, T. S. Eliot reading his own poetry. Uh, but it's almost the death of his poetry. <laughs> you yeah. can't believe <laughs> that the, the man who created such poetry has such a mm. dour, um, offhand kind of delivery. Mm. So, you know, I, I love listening to Sir Alec Guinness reading <laughs> his poems, but to hear mm. him read them, mm. wow, it's a real turn off. Really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have never listened to him read that, but that doesn't read them, but it doesn't surprise me because there's kind of a famous story about um he was invited, I think, to uh the palace or something at one point to to do a, a reading for the royal family. And I believe this is when the, the late queen was still, you know, quite young and, and her father was still alive. But I think it was the queen mother or someone afterwards, they they all kind of agreed, like, what an unpleasant man his poetry reading was terrible and I remember thinking <laughs> like wow they didn't like T.S. Eliot but yeah so there it seems so yeah it's always struck me that maybe there, there's something of this this mm. man that maybe needs to present a certain sort of face of emotional reserve and sort of having it all together um, and has these deep wells of emotion that he can only express in poetry, but maybe could not express in his relationships. Mm -hmm. Shall I play you a few lines? Yes. Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> a cold coming we had of it, just the worst time of the year for a journey and such a long journey. The ways deep and the weather sharp, the very dead of winter. And the camels, galled, sore-footed, refractory, lying down in the melting snow. There were times... Mm -hmm. We regretted the summer palaces on slopes, the terraces, and the silken girls bringing sherbet. Then the camel men cursing and grumbling, and running away and wanting their liquor and women, and the night fires going out. Yes. <laughs> what it reminds me of, you know, uh, Microsoft Word now has, yes. has mm. this facility where they can you can play back uh, what you've written, and they. When you put in South African English, 
the accent they, they, they give you when you listen to yourself having written something and now having it played back to you, it sounds almost a bit like that. By contrast. A cold coming we had of it. Just the worst time of the year for a journey and such a long journey. The ways deep and the weather sharp, the very dead of winter. And the camels galled, sore-footed, refractory, lying down in the melting snow. There were times we regretted the summer palaces on slopes, the terraces, and the silken girls bringing sherbet. Then the camel men cursing and grumbling, and running away and wanting their liquor and women, and the night fires going out, and the lack of shelters, and the cities hostile, and the towns unfriendly, and the villages dirty and charging high prices. <laughs> That's Alec Guinness. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to me, like, the, those two voices, they both have a kind of formal, um, I suppose Elliot's is more mid-Atlantic and mm. uh, Guinness's is a little bit more British, but these similar sort of, like, mid, the, those more formal kind of almost newscaster voices of the mid-century, you know, like upper glass. <laughs> but, but, so there's a, there's a similar amount of formality and a sort of, um, but, but there's a life in Guinnesses. There's like, there's expression in it. I, so I hear what you're talking about. Mm. But then getting back into the content of what it, the thing I found in listening to uh, James Matthew Wilson's thing is about the central preoccupation of finding this, the, the still point and this whole extraordinary paradoxical relationship between time and eternity. And I was, my imagination was rather inspired by the idea of finding that that still point that let the wheel of time turn from the perspective of the still point of an eternal truth of a divine mystery and i'm wondering whether in fact it was through his own struggles with his own romantic life and this and the fact that he was living between two great wars and the whole tragedy of what was happening there and the, I mean you read Wasteland and you just see a situation where I was just telling Mark you know it seemed like a hundred years later looking at South Africa you know we can see the Wasteland materializing here too and what do you do in this situation it just seems to be falling apart and I just found it so inspiring for me even to the point that I was revising my YouTube um, you know, description about who I am and what I do. And I used that exact uh, that term. I said, my work is now to let the wheel of time turn from the perspective of the still point of the eternal truth of the divine mystery as revealed in the incarnation. And I explain what I then do. You know, judge me on not how well I've done it in time, but whether I've actually had a level of detachment which is quite paradoxical too, because another thing which uh, Wilson says is it's about attachment to detachment, but not indifference. The people just become indifferent because they can't handle the sheer enormity of the of the crisis in its multi level com levels of complexity. So in that sense, I say it's just such a sense of relief to me to be able to say, "Phew." Whereas, you know, 30, 20 years ago, I was struggling with my own ego, wanting to kind of make perfect my will and, oh, my gosh, how am I ever going to get there? I'm now saying, thank goodness, it's not actually about me trying to, you know, sort of live myself, my life within this torturous situation because it's so impossible. You're never going to get it right. And, I, you know, when I get criticism and I just can now say, look, I can shrug it off. And I said, it actually doesn't kind of get to me in the way that it did even two, three years ago, because I, I hope I'm getting a little bit more into that place of that still point. And that's why I really wanted to talk with the two of you, because I sense your own spiritual journey has been very similar. Yeah, you know, I, I will say, because I spoke about kind of my initial encounter with the four quartets, but it was several years later when I was... Um, I had I had gotten into contemplative Christianity and a centering prayer practice and things like that, that this poem really started to open up for me because I could read those lines about like the still point at the center of the turning world or where he's talking about. Um, I'm looking for the the lines where he talks about kind of the place between it 
detach attachment and indifference, um, which is the detachment, right? Mm. Um, and I can't find it at the moment, but those, I thought, oh, mm. oh, this, this makes sense. I, I, I'm starting to understand what, what this means. You know, I'm starting to, this is starting to make sense to me. And, um, and even then I think it didn't quite, I had to live some more and have some of my own experiences with being very, very attached to things, very, very attached to the outcome of things. And it's funny because that concept almost seems quite Buddhist to me. And I don't know that Elliot ever really studied Buddhism, although he probably would have been familiar with it. Certainly that concept is present in a lot of, you know, the Christian tradition as well. So I don't think he had to have gotten it from there, but that's often where we hear it um, today. If we hear, we hear that idea of the idea of non-attachment, I suppose. But yeah, this, this process of being present and caring about something without being stuck in it and thinking it's got to happen a certain way, or I've got to make it happen, or it all depends on me is really the magic. I think it's like the place where we need to be. And so much listening to James Matthew Wilson's kind of, uh, I suppose, exegesis of this was like, very eye opening for me because it, it helped to deepen some of these themes and the way he talks about how Eliot throughout this um throughout this series of poems is trying to really get at this the stillness of the eternal, the eternal, the unchanging, and and to bring that awareness of that point of stillness, that point of the unchanging into the world of time and matter where things are always changing and we can never go back and recover the past. But what we can do is catch an echo of the past that reminds us of something that we come back to, which is that still point that reminds us of the garden, that reminds us of the tree that we come back to mm. again and again and again. <laughs> um, and it's so present, I think, when you get to the little getting because this is when he is in the middle of World War II. And he's talking about it and he's talking about what it means to be, to care about England, to care about the country he's in, to care about the place without thinking with, while rejecting this notion that you're sort of, sort of returned to this glory of an ancient past, which is, I think maybe what he sees the Nazis as trying to do. Like they've got this whole um, ideal of like Aryan superiority that we've got to like reclaim the glory of like our, you know, mm. our ways he's he's finding this way forward that says yes i love this place and um it means something to me and it's valuable and it and it's shot through with the glory of the divine and it's worth defending but i, I i'm not you know under the delusion that um that i'm going to somehow return back to the past by by getting stuck in a a highly nationalist ide ideology or something like that before I ask Mike to respond, the thought just occurred to me, um, <laughs> which brings me back to having, you know, those lines tattooed on your back. You have, in a sense, incarnated those words of his on the back, on your back. You put it on your <laughs> flesh. <laughs> you talk about the enfleshment or the embodiment of that, which for me is, again, what makes it so, in one sense, so exciting to, to have found a deeper faith in that incarnational presence, because even though I know it's not about me, and I'm, you know, and the whole ego thing is, I can sort of cast aside, and that's a, that's the a fourth temptation, you know, do the right thing, the wrong reason. John, put it out your way. Follow Thomas of Beckett. Follow T. S. Eliot. Follow Rebecca Burt. Mark. All these people have basically done that. Who have actually got a serenity about them, which then actually just says, well, this is what so much. This is what I want us to offer to the society in such torment is that it's all there's some consolation for you to to know that jesus came in the flesh and the, and that comes up mark in the journey of the magi hey mm. i just wanted to pick up on the buddhist connection rebecca your your intuition is is spot on uh, i'm looking at a something called liverpool blog <laughs> called Through the Looking Glass, T.S. Eliot and Indian Philosophy. The writer writes, Eliot's interest in Buddhism led him to attend and to take copious notes on Masaharu Anesaki's course on 
schools of the religious and philosophical thought of Japan and their connections with those of India and China. Mm. In fact, Eliot was so deeply preoccupied with Buddhism that he had even thought of learning Tibetan so that he could read Buddhist texts in the language which were otherwise not available. However, despite his respect for Buddhism and his integration of Buddhist concepts in his creative work, Eliot subsumed them within his Christian discourse and emphasized the differences between Buddhism and Christianity, especially in his insistence on the need for the Christian doctrine of divine grace, as opposed to the Buddhist emphasis on the individual's will. Mm. So that's quite uh, that's interesting. interesting, yeah. Well, I think of James Finley as being somebody who also exemplifies that combination. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, I didn't know that about him, but that absolutely makes absolute sense. That, Just the sense I get of his personality, it, it makes sense that he would be drawn to, to sort of Buddhist and Indian philosophy. Um, and yet I think, yeah, there is something uniquely Christian about this very incarnational emphasis and wanting to marry both the that that place of detachment with the beauty and the um, the ever changingness of embodied life, which inspired you to write a rap song, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's got multiple no, no, talents. No. <laughs> you want to tell us about that? No, that wasn't the inspiration for the rap song. <laughs> <laughs> that was purely a, a very modern um, occurrence of the latest incarnation of the Israel-Hamas conflict. Mm. Yes. But do you want to say something more about what inspired you? And maybe let's bring us to this dreadful reality of what we now having we can't avoid is what's happening in, in Gaza. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting from a, a sort of temporal perspective, um, because I don't know whether it's the intensity of the conflict, the number of Palestinians who've been killed, the number of children who have been killed, the, um, the speed at which news uh, travels, uh, you know, via main media and social media. Uh, we've got a Gray Lurie who's trying to compete um, for <laughs> attention <laughs> here. Um, but, you know, the, the world's focus is very much on the conflict in the Middle East, now at the expense of the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Mm. But Israel and Hamas have been at war and there have been conflicts, you know, mm. over the last 20 years. Mm. So, you know, mm. uh, in a sense, our mind plays tricks with us, as though, you know, this is the, the first manifestation mm. of this. Mm. And that the incarnation holds true. I mean, and, I mean, it's just been so ironic over this Christmas season where Bethlehem is, you know, these images of, you know, the nativity the scene being buried under rubble. Mm. Rebecca, do you want to say about how this has affected you and your own spiritual journey um, oh. from your perspective? Because the connection that us South Africans are concerned about this because, you know, there's such a parallel between apartheid and what's happening in Gaza and in fact South Africa is now bringing the, uh, the the whole case against Israel in the International Court of Justice. Um, it's uh, our country's doing it and people are saying this is the right thing to do. Oh gosh this is such a big topic to talk about and I haven't really done it too much in, in public because I just partly because I feel like there's been such a, a pressure to, to say that you're on one side or the other. Um, and to make statements that aren't necessarily helpful, especially <laughs> if you're not somebody who uh, is is Israeli or Palestinian or involved in, you know, Middle East conflict negotiation or something like that. Um, but I will say it's funny because I actually another one of my my favorite poets of, of the same era as Eliot and also someone who especially later in his life was a deeply Christian thinker is W.H. Auden. And every time, every year at Christmas, I return to his great and very long Christmas oratorio called For the Time Being. And um, 
I was really sitting with it this year and I even started writing something about it for like a, an essay to put out on Christmas. I, I do it every year. I, I quote something from him. And a lot of times I quote the slime where he talks about run, run to Bethlehem. And I couldn't read that this year without thinking about what was going on in Gaza. You know, I couldn't quite ever get to a place where I felt satisfied with it. And I thought like, oh gosh, I feel like anything I say, people are going to, I, because I, it's quite intense. I don't know how it is there, but like right now it's just quite intense between people who have either like really doubled down on Israel has a right to exist, you know, versus Palestine, you know, from the river to the sea. Like mm. I, I can acknowledge that absolutely Israel uh, has caused a lot of suffering for the Palestinian people. I think they have had a lot of injustice uh, that does not legitimize what Hamas did. And I think it's, it also doesn't mean that, you know, Hamas is necessarily representative of all Palestinian people. Um, what, what really comes to mind when I look at this conflict is uh, Rene Girard's insight that like in a conflict like this, each side always thinks that they're the ag most aggrieved one and that the other person is always the one that made the first, uh, that, that started it, right? And in some ways they're both right and they're both wrong. You have it handy there, because it'd be lovely for you to read if you like. <laughs> Let me look. Um, Why are you looking for that? I just want to say that I was. Then my next question to you was going to say, has your knowledge of Rene Girard and mimetic theory and that helped you make a bit more sense of it? Because and you answered it before I could ask you. <clears throat> because what I just to say while you're looking for that, I, I came across a, a documentary on our satellite TV which is made before the, the current conflict. It was a year or so ago, a three-part series on the rise of Mossad. And it was not made with the consciousness of trying to influence current course of events, but just gave me an insight. And it really made me think, now that I've been more familiar with René Girard's thinking, thanks to you and others, is that the Mossad actually imitated so much of what the Jews experienced under the Nazis. There was almost a sense which there was this mimetic, this imitation of that method and feeling, well, look, they've done this to us. We can break all the rules. We can do what we please because we are not justified in so doing. It seems to me a very important and fruitful thing to try and do, except I'm gonna, like you, I feel like I'm gonna end up being shot at from both sides because yeah. it's not a popular position to hold because the world desires a binary, a, a polarization. And, and again, that's why I keep quoting El Zalzenit's thing. You know, if only it were that so simple, if only we could draw a line between good and evil and put all the bad people on that side of the line and we are the good people and we just get rid of them all. And I just mm -hmm. feel that we don't quite know have developed sufficient language to be able to articulate that. Yeah, that's I've never heard that before, but that's a really interesting point. And I think it makes absolute sense because what you you have here with Israel is like this history of these people who had something just unimaginably horrible done to them. I mean, really, truly like the most blatant example of of just a, a massive institutional evil that I think we can imagine. And, and yet then it becomes a justification for, like you said, like uh, kind of mimicking that behavior in with it, with the justification that, that, you know, well, this is what we have to do to stay safe and to defend ourselves. I, I did find the poem, the piece of the poem. It's very, very long uh, work that some of it is in prose, some of it is in verse. Um, and it's definitely worth reading the whole thing, but I will say this in for the time being, Auden does this thing where he is telling the story of the incarnation um, and all the characters that we think of, like the shepherds, the angels, Herod, um, you know, everyone. Uh, but he's also, he's both speaking about it as if he's there in, in you know, zero AD or whatever. And um, also in his in his context in England, right? Like in mid-century <laughs> wartime England. And so, um, you know, he's really trying to, to, to tell it from a perspective that people can relate these sort of timeless themes to their own lives. He portrays a world in which people are constantly seeking all sorts of novelty and distraction um, and, and 
almost exploring every possible idea and pleasure and tactic and strategy for managing life that they possibly can in an attempt to avoid this deep foreboding inside of them. And the, the deep foreboding, and he, he likens it to like a, a dark wood, is that like to really face the truth there that's at the center of each of us is to come face to face with God. And, and that that is, we're all incredibly afraid of that. We're, that we're afraid to find that, that, that this, um, this father, this God that we've kind of sentimentalized is actually quite terrifying. And you get this too in, um in Eliot's journey of the Magi, this, I, I you've got these Magi that are, are seeking, um they're, they're seeking out this, child that, that's been promised by the star and yet they know that it's going to completely upend the world that they've become used to and and that they've they know how to orient and and there's something quite frightening about that you get that that kind of um that bit of foreboding at the end of that poem as well and so Auden rather kind of kind of goes through exploring these different perspectives of the magi who kind of stand in for um the the learned men of science and you know intellectuals and people like that and then um and and they're you know they're seeking their distraction and all these different sorts of you know like science philosophy things like that and then the shepherds who are kind of a stand in for the working class and they seek distraction in uh the pool hall and you know like the strip club and that kind of stuff and finally the chorus of angels break through and they say Unto you a child, a son is given, praising, proclaiming the ingression of love. Earth's darkness invents the blaze of heaven, and frigid silence meditates a song. For great joy has filled the narrow and the sad, while the emphasis of the rough and big, the abiding crag and wandering wave. And, and when he says that the abiding crag there, it's a reference to God because earlier he he compares God to the abyss. So the emphasis of the rough and big and the, uh, the, the abiding crag and the wandering wave is on forgiveness. Mm. Sing glory, glory to God and goodwill to men. All, all, all of them run to Bethlehem. Mm. And this is really, I mean, what he, I think he's saying is like, when, when we're willing to let go of all the things we've been trying to do to manage life, to, to manage our existence, to make sense of it, and we're willing to face that sort of horror of, of meaninglessness that comes when we let go of the meaning that we've been creating, that's when the Holy Spirit, that's when Christ can actually be born in us. That's when, that's when the incarnation actually happens. I, and I think that that's, you know, that's kind of what Gerard is pointing at as well. You know, he's, he's analyzing this mimetic rivalry that in some ways yeah. I really believe is like rooted deep in the sort of formation of, of language itself. Mm. And that has, uh, and the mm. way we think about things, right. And, and it's done so much to create the world we live in. At some point you have to get to the point where you realize, Hey, there's no way out of this. This is a trap. This mimetic rivalry is a trap. And where do you go with from that? Well, there's nothing at some point you have to be willing to face the abyss and allow it to uh, to take you to a place of transcendence. Mm-hmm. I just, there's just one other thing I wanted to share from this piece that I, I was writing and never finished. I, I had read an interview in uh, the Times and in, in the, the London Times with a uh, British Palestinian politician, Layla Moran. So she has extended family that are trapped in Gaza right now. She said something that I found very powerful that I think kind of speaks to this. She said, I have equal sympathy for the Israelis demanding their hostages back. I don't see any downside or diminishing of pain to acknowledge theirs at the same time. What we need to get through is this idea of revenge. What we need to get to is an understanding that somebody else's pain is also justified. It just might not be the same pain. One day, maybe they will even share in the pain as something in common, not something that sets them apart. Yeah, just to come back to... Um, you know, the nativity scene um, amidst the rubble. Um, you know, in, in Journey of the Magi, um, you know, we have quite an interesting perspective of, you know, the journey of the three wise men from the East. You know, it's, it's a very romantic depiction mm. in 
uh, the Gospels, the three wise men from the East who, guided by a star, go in search of the baby Jesus, offering him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And even though uh, Jesus' birth is in a stable and, you know, surrounded by animals, it's still a very romantic depiction, um, you know, whereas the Magi in, in Eliot's poem, you know, a, a hard time we had of it, um, mm. he says. And, you know, the various, it's the dead of winter, you know, the various obstacles they have to face in getting there. And, you know, for, for me, the nativity scene amidst the rubble mm. is actually a very poignant mm. and quite accurate mm. um, depiction mm. of the incarnation. Mm. I mean, I always never still try to find it hard to come to terms with the feast of the, you know, of the of the, the massacre of the innocents, with all these children being killed because they're trying to, you know, get rid of Jesus. And it's, it's, it was one of those things which is, still perplexes me. I've been listening to Malcolm Geit, and he gave two poems that he recited on Christmas Eve. He's this delightful individual who kind of has this guy knocking on his door and coming into his room. And he, and he recited one of his poems, which he wrote before this whole conflict. And it was just chillingly prophetic, in a sense, of what was happening, and echoes so many of the themes that you've just spoken about, which David Uden can have picked up on. I'm sure your heart, as well as mine, and lots of other people's, have really been torn open by the news, the appalling violence. That's One of the things that strikes me is that Part of the message of Christmas itself is that Jesus doesn't stay safe and comfy and cosy up in heaven. He, he comes down and gets involved and he takes the risk. And the world into which he was born was torn and fractured and there were soldiers on the streets then. And in fact, we know that not long after he was born, you know, his family were, were forced to flee, you know, because of the violence of Herod. And God knew perfectly well when he chose to become fully human, the world who's coming into. And I think he did it to be in solidarity with those who suffer. It doesn't matter which side or label God. God became human. The gospel is for Jew and Gentile alike. Um, and I'm sure God's heart is also like so many people's torn open by the, the suffering. Anyway, I wanted to read you a Christmas Eve stroke Christmas Day poem, and I'm going to read you a new one. I have to say, I actually composed this poem before the recent tragic event in particular, cycle of tragic events began in Israel and Gaza. But it's getting darker, darker all the time, and she is weary and beset with fear. Yet in the darkness of her womb he stirs, her tiny hope, the one who is to come, so on she plots, on past the hostile stairs, the checkpoints and the soldiers on the street, seeking some shelter, somewhere to retreat and bring to birth the hidden light she bears. She finds her shelter now and we attend her, attend this burdened girl who speaks for us, whispers to God a broken world's soft yes, come to be born with us, come Find us here, out face for us the darkness we can't face. Show us the face of love that casts out fear. And of course I'm remembering what Jesus himself would say um, when he grew up and survived that terribly shaky start. He said um, that, that love casts out fear and if we're to find a way of casting out the fears on every side and the fears that breed the hatreds and insecurities, then I think love is the missing word. Now, what are the signs of the times? What, are, what is the prophetic role of reading what's going on in our own micro context of South Africa, in my own community, where the same basically seeds of mimetic rivalry becoming mimetic conflict, becoming violence, how do we nip it in the bud? How do we actually, because with the consciousness that we have, because of, this is the extraordinary thing, as much as I say it's not about me and not what I've done, God's given us this consciousness as human beings to speak into situations, and it makes a difference. I mean, and, and it's 
it catches me by surprise, almost to the point where I don't want my prayers to be answered, because suddenly when you see the difference that is being made, people then look to you and they think you've got some special silver bullet to solve it, but it never gets any easier. It gets more and more, which is why we need each other. We need this, this, this wonderful sense of the mystical body of Christ, which actually I'm experiencing so wonderfully just watching you, Elizabeth Oldfield, Malcolm Guy, our, our mutual friend, uh, Dougald Hine, Alison McIntosh. These are people that I've never even met face to face, <laughs> but somehow you just know that there's something that's happening in the midst of it all. And isn't it wonderful that we can continue this momentum? Well, I didn't think that we'd end up talking about Palestine and Gaza necessarily, but that's the whole point about being open to outcome, not <laughs> attached to it. And I just hope that this is now proving to be helpful to people who are just not, not still trying to make sense and meaning of it all. But Rebecca, tell us a bit about your uh, wonderful um, work that you've now, as a spiritual director, as a sub-stacker, and as somebody who's really been a great help to me, I have to say, in, in giving a sense of purpose. And I just love the fact it was through a mutual friend, Dougald Hine, that I got to know you. And I now see you, you're, you've got him lined up to speak on your platform coming soon. And I can't wait to see that. So tell us a bit about what your plans are. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I'm still kind of figuring that out. Um, so, yeah, I am a spiritual director. I am... I've been involved in the activist world uh, for for many years, and also in, you know, the Christian world uh, in various roles, lay roles. So I, um, yeah, my Substack is Rebecca Burnt at Substack.com. It's called the Unfolding, and I, I, I write uh, about a little bit of everything, but I think a lot about faith and how it applies to the times that we're living in. Um, I have recently started a podcast and I will be putting that stuff on YouTube as well. I haven't, um, I haven't done that yet. So I will have a YouTube channel at some point. And I'm just really interested in these kinds of conversations that we're having. Um, to me, this is so rich and so valuable. And I want to thank you, uh, both for, for this. And I, I, you know, I, I was thinking, man, there's all this stuff I wanted to talk about with, uh, four quartets that we didn't even get to, which is fine. Cause I think the, the discussion went where it needed to go. But, um, so then the other thing I will say is, yes, I am a spiritual director. You know, I do see clients and stuff. And, um, I went through a year long psychic training program and I bring some of those skills into the spiritual direction that I do, where I help people kind of get in touch with their own intuition and, and, um, and do some energy healing and things like that. So, uh, I'm kind of an eclectic person, but that's what I do. One of the things I just like to quickly ask you, um, which you mentioned when talking with Elizabeth Oldfield, that this resurgence of people coming to faith, to Christian yeah. faith, nice. through psychedelics and through magic mushroom trips. Have you got experience mm -hmm. of that? Is that part of it? Because, you know, I know people who have. And yeah. I'm not trying to say, well, how do I come? That's not been my experience at all. I mean, yeah. I mean, I know people who've had that experience on mushrooms. I also know people who have had that experience, um, uh, like in Buddhist meditation where they they're doing, they're at some Buddhist retreat center and they get a vision of Jesus. And they're like, what is this? Um, I'll say for me, I had a really interesting encounter on ayahuasca, uh, where I had a pretty rough time on the ayahuasca. And as it was, it was really funny because I did like a three nights in a row with this shaman. And as I was waking up after the third night, I just felt like, what the hell just happened to me? I was coming out of the trip, but I heard the, the ayahuasca spirit say to me, you should go and have Eucharist. It's going to help you integrate this. Hmm. Stop doing like, they're like, don't do any more ayahuasca for now to try to find the answers, go and have the Eucharist. And it was actually Sunday morning that this was happening. So by the time I was like really awake enough and ready to, to, go and drive. Uh, I had just enough time to go to my local Episcopal church and go into the Eucharist, uh, the, into, you know, into church service, into the mass or whatever. And 
I got there a little late and I, I remember just thinking, cause I hadn't been to church in a while. I, I wouldn't have said that I wasn't Christian. It just was like one of those things where I was like, well, I don't know. I'm kind of on the outs with Jesus a little bit right now. Like maybe we'll get back together at some point. Um, but I went to, I, I went to the church service and I'm sitting there and I'm like, well, I don't know why I have to have this Eucharist. I hope this gets over soon. And I just remember feeling kind of like, God, this is taking forever. I'm really tired. I've been tripping all night. Like, I just want to go home and take a shower and go to bed. And, um, but there's this moment in the liturgy where, um, you know, they talk about or something and Jesus rising again on the third day. And I just had this moment of thinking, you know what? Cause I realized this is what just happened to me. I've been through this three night experience and like come out of it. And it's like the third day and I've risen and I'm coming to church. And I thought, I bet when Jesus, if, if he really did rise from the dead, I bet he thought what the hell or what the fuck just happened to me. That's literally what I thought in my head because that's how I felt. (laughs) That's how I felt. And I said, I said, he probably is like, what just happened? What was that crazy trip I just went on? And I just started laughing in the middle of church, but that began a whole (laughs) thing for me of like, I, I would take the, I would go and take the Eucharist like multiple times a week. And I started to really understand, like, this is a, frankly, became much more Catholic in my approach to the Eucharist. Cause I was like, there's something really, truly magical happening here. And I don't understand it, but I want to understand it more. So that, um, that began a whole, a whole journey for me. I'm just smiling at the reaction that <laughs> some of my friends and my Catholic <laughs> community are going to be saying about that. And I was saying to our, to them, Folk, you know, this is, I shared your video with you and Elizabeth Oldfield. I said, folk, people are coming to faith through, you know, th- through the ayahuasca, through these, but are we ready to be a place for them to actually go through that process of formation? Which, of course, I just loved Elizabeth's point about that and how important that is and how we must be careful of just, you know, claiming a, a convert and planting a, our flag in their hearts and say, oh, one of us now, Gethsemane is not a pleasant experience. And it seems to me that the only path that is really, that has to be trod is to yield ourselves to that divine midpoint, to, you know, that still midpoint, which of course is what our sense happened to Jesus. Mark, do you want any closing thoughts before I wrap up? Well, just to say what I'm going to be doing um, because, you know, time past and time future <laughs> are both perhaps present. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be doing some consulting to make ends meet. But what I really want to be doing more of is writing poetry, delivering more sermons at church. I, over the last few years, got more and more involved in our Anglican church. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that our priest in charge is even nudging me towards ministry, but I'm not there yet. But interestingly, the reason he's doing that is that he appreciates ambivalence and ambiguity. You know, Mm -hmm. does not want people who are overconfident have got all the answers. Mm -hmm. So people who are themselves still searching Mm. and we are searching till the Mm. day we die Mm. lord i believe but help my unbelief in fact i I was reflecting on that passage again it's all about you know in a father's deep concern about his son who's got they called it a dumb spirit on him and for me in our in our church too we we, we now formed a preacher's circle where every every month we will have someone other than our priest preaching or and um and we've also going through a formation process to the the, the plan we've got is is to actually have each person preach have two other people from the group help prepare the homily and then two other people from the to help you process it afterwards i mean gosh isn't that a wonderful way of going about ministry it's trinitarian i just love the idea of this trinitarian way of dealing with preaching last word from you rebecca before i wrap up anything oh no i don't think i have anything to say just thank you i I hope it gives you a better idea of where what i'm really about uh, as i say at the beginning of my advertisement 
I seek the things that make for peace, uh, which is from Luke chapter 19, verse 42, to ensure that human rights require meaning as a basis for restorative justice and peace building. I'm very concerned that we have an election coming up this year and that it might lead to violence and it might end up being stolen. And I'm just feeling a dreadful sense that that would lead us into back into the abyss that we thought we had escaped 30 years ago and we had our first democratic election. And that's really why I'm connecting with people like Rebecca and everyone else around the world, because this is not a South African problem. It's a global problem that I think all of us can identify with as we negotiate the, the, you know, the terrible realities of global climate change and the conflicts and the wars and everything that's happening in this wonderful, beautiful planet. So thank you so much. Well, what a wonderful conversation that was. Thank you so much, Rebecca and Mike. By the way, I forgot to say that uh, on my YouTube channel, at this link now appearing, you will find Michael reciting T.S. Eliot's The Four Quartets in full. So, Rebecca, you can hear that he has a much better voice than, in fact, both T.S. Eliot and Sir Alec Guinness. Well, this dialogue has helped me grow so much. Uh, I hope that they are now helpful to others and I would love your comments and your reflections uh, and I will try to respond. Finally, to take us back to the personal and the spiritual, let's end with a hopeful note. I thought I would play out with the second poem that Malcolm Geit recited on New Year's Eve as an encouragement to bridge us from the Christmas season into the new year. And this poem uh, is called Descent. And it's, it's, it's a poem which is astonished by what happens at, at Bethlehem in the midst of the great classical civilizations of pagan antiquity. And if you like the Olympian gods and the, the perfect Grecian marble friezes and everybody up there being immortal and disdaining us, um, God uh, says, no, I'm going to do something completely different. So this poem is called Descent. They sought to soar into the skies, those classic gods of high renown, for lofty pride aspires to rise. But you came down, you dropped down from the mountains sheer, forsook the eagle for the dove. The other gods demanded fear, but you gave love. Where chiselled marble seemed to freeze their abstract and perfected form, compassion brought you to your knees. Your blood was warm. They called for blood in sacrifice and victims on their altars bled. When no one else could pay the price, you died instead. They towered above our mortal plane, dismissed this restless flesh with scorn, aloof from birth and death and pain. But you were born, born to these burdens, born by all. Born with us all, astride the grave, weak to be with us when we fall, and strong to save.